Good morning, boys and girls. How are you today? I'm sorry I missed last week. Uh, I was sick. But today we're going to do two names of God uh, to catch up for missing last week. The first one is God is omnipotent. You say that word with me? Omnipotent. That word means God has all power. God has all power. We're going to read a few verses that talk about that. And I'm going to read you a story. So I'm going to turn the camera around so that you can see the pictures. And uh, instead of my face. As we talk about God being omnipotent. All powerful. This is Luke chapter 1, and this is when uh, the angel was talking to Mary. And in verse 37, I want you to see these words right here. For nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. He has all power. He is omnipotent. We're going to look at a couple more verses. This is Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. He had all power. He had power over disease. And sickness. And then in Psalm 147 and verse 3, it says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He has all power. He is able to heal physically, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. God has power over our minds, our bodies. But not only does he have power over us, he used that power to give us salvation. And let's just read it. I'm going to read you a simple book here. It's called, Who Tells the Wind? Who tells the wind? Today I saw a bluebird in the tree outside my window. Daddy says that means spring is coming. Who tells the bluebird to build her nest? God does. In the spring, the flowers in my yard begin to bloom. Who tells the flowers it is time to grow? But you can say the answer with me. God does. In the spring, there are new animals on the farm. Who tells the baby animals it is time to be born? Oops. God does. Soon the days get hot. I splash in my pool to cool off. Who tells the sun it's time for hot summer days? God does. On warm summer nights, I see small lights first here, then there. Who tells the fireflies it is time to shine brightly? God does. After summer comes autumn. The trees turn red, orange, and gold. Soon their leaves will fall to the ground. Who tells the leaves it's time to change colors? God does. Also in the autumn, the squirrels start hunting for nuts to store for the winter. Who tells the squirrels it's time to look for their food? God does. Brr. Icy white frost sticks to my window. 
cold winds are blowing. Who tells the wind it is time for winter? God does. Snowflakes fall softly on my face when I go outside to build a snowman. Who tells the snow to cover the earth? I know. Do you? God does. This word, I want you to remember, it's a big word, but it means God has all power. There's also two other words that start with omni. Omni means all. Omnipresent means God is always there. And omnip omniscient means God is all-knowing. Those three words all start with O. And remind us that our God is all we need. He's all. I would like to now go to the next word that we're going to do for today. And that's the letter P. The Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Let's look at this verse. Isaiah 9 verse 6. In our Bibles. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Now you may wonder about what does that mean that Jesus is the Prince of Peace? I'm going to read you another story, and then we're going to look at one of the Beatitudes and talk about that. God loves even me. I want to thank you, God. When I am sick, knowing you love me helps me to feel better. When I am sad and lonely, knowing you love me helps me to smile. Knowing you love me makes me want to fly like a bird. God, you are always good, but I'm not. Sometimes I do bad things. Thank you for patiently loving me. And Lord, Please help me to patiently love too. For high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who revere him. Psalm 103 verse 11. Just like a kind father, you always love me. See, she's waking her dad up early. Lord, you know it is hard for me to be good. But you love me, even as I try. Lord, your kingdom rules over all, and everyone everywhere should thank you for your love. I want to thank you, God, for your love. Now, you might wonder, why did I read you that story about God's love and God loving us because that is what Jesus, the Prince of Peace, came to do for us. Because of God's love, Jesus brought peace for us, peace with God. Because of Jesus, we can have a peace that is different from any other peace. 
It's a peace that passes all understanding. Philippians uh, chapter 4 verse 7 says, The peace that we have is because of what Jesus did when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. Now we can be at peace with God. God no longer has to punish us for our sins. Like in the book, we do things that are wrong. We can't be good on our own. And because of that, we needed Jesus to come and die for us. So God sent Jesus and through Jesus, we have peace with God. So we can be in a relationship with God. We can pray to God, sing to God, ask God for help. And then because of the peace with God, he gives us the peace of God. So not only do we have peace with God because of his Holy Spirit, we have the peace of God within us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're to be peacemakers while we're here on this earth. And the kingdom of heaven belongs to us because we have the peace with God and the peace of God. Even when things are all crazy around us, even with this coronavirus and school being different and so many different things, um, not being able to get together for big family holidays, we can still have the peace of God because it's a peace that is not dependent on our circumstances. It's not dependent on what we do. It's dependent on what Jesus already did. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18 says, As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, you're not responsible for the actions of others. But as far as it depends on you, on your part, you are to live at peace. So if we are trying to live at peace, that means our homes are going to be more peaceful. Our neighbors and us, our relationships with them will be more peaceful. Hopefully our schools, our communities, and our world will be more peaceful. The problem is many people do not know and have the peace of God. So we have a lot of stuff going on in our world that is not a worldly peacefulness, but we can try as far as it depends on us to live at peace with people. That means when your brother or sister does something that annoys you or um, maybe says something mean to you you remember that verse live at peace as much as it depends on me live at peace be a peacemaker and you don't argue back or you don't say something mean back or you don't fight back because you want to be a peacemaker it's such a wonderful wonderful blessing to have the peace of god in our lives and the peace of god we don't understand but we can have that joy and that, that assurance that God is in control. And so it gives us peace, even when we don't understand. That's why it says in Philippians um, 4, 6, and 7, it says, don't be worried about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, Present your request to God. Tell him your request. Tell him what you need. And the peace of God, will, will, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So 
Christians have a peace that the world doesn't understand. But we should try to spread that peace into the world. Okay, I'm going to read you one more story today. Um, while I'm getting that, let's sing a song about our omnipotent, mighty God. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord. Ruler of everything. Glory to our God. Glory to our King. Glory to our Lord. Ruler of everything. His name is higher. Higher than any other name. His power is greater. For he has created everything. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord. Ruler of everything. He's the ruler of everything. This book is called I'll Be With You Always. Justin William Chase Jr. leaned around the half-open door of his father's study. Actually, it wasn't so much a study as an art studio. And whenever the hallway smelled like turpentine and oil paint, Justin could tell his father was about to begin work on a new painting. In his long paint splattered smock, he was turning a large easel in the direction of the sunlight that streamed through the tall window. Next to the easel was a small table covered with bottles and brushes, tubes, paint rags, and several palettes. Justin, who wanted nothing more than to be a famous painter like his father, saw his chance to have fun. Father, he said as he ran into the room, may I help you get ready? Justin reached for the couple of the tubes of paint and began to put them in neat little rows. Better than that, Mr. Chase said with a smile. Why don't you bring my stool over here and sit up here on my knee? That was exactly what the little boy was hoping his father would say. Within minutes, he was doing his favorite thing in his favorite place. He was sitting on his father's lap before a huge canvas in the studio of Boston's most famous painter in the 1800s, his dad. What's more, his dad was letting him paint. Nothing thrilled him more than to hold one of his father's brushes. Then Mr. Chase would wrap his large hand around Justin's and dab the brush into the paint. Holding onto his son's hand and the brush, the artist would swirl the most beautiful colors across the canvas. Justin, all wide-eyed and grinning, delighted in feeling his father's hand around his. He thrilled to see the canvas begin to fill with red and blue and yellow even more. He was painting. Actually, his father was doing the painting. But from his point of view, it was hard to tell the difference. He didn't know what was more fun, creating something beautiful right before his eyes or sitting on his father's knee and feeling the warmth and gentle pressure of his father's hand. But the little boy didn't really care. All he cared about was being with his dad, feeling important and safe. With such care and good training, it's no surprise that when within a matter of years, Justin William Chase Jr. grew up to be a famous painter. He went to a fine arts school in New England once while Justin was painting, his teachers remarked, how did you become so skilled with the brush? The young man turned and with smudges of paint on his chin, he said softly, I can almost feel my dad's hand around mine when I paint. Justin then shook his head. My father's getting older, but he's still the best painter in the world. And one day I will be famous just like him. 
The old artist, his father, would say to his son, Justin, don't make your fame, don't make fame your goal. Just enjoy the gift God has given you. Paint for him and give of yourself wherever he places you. Yes, Father, Justin said, and he would nod obediently. But when he was back at school flipping through his books and happened to see a page with one of his father's paintings on it, he'd swell with pride. He would one day go to Paris to study and become a great painter, a famous painter, just like his father. Finally, the day arrived when he was to leave. Mr. Chase stood with his grown son on the Boston docks next to a big steamship about to sail for Europe. Justin put down his suitcases and hugged his aging father. He was surprised at how frail and thin the older man seemed. Justin hated leaving him. The trip across the ocean took many days. Oh, how he missed his father and how he hoped he was feeling better. Then he would walk forward to the bow and feel the wind in his face and think about Europe and Paris and attending the best art school in the world. It was even better than he imagined. Every day he and his fellow students visited museums and galleries, took long field trips out into the French countryside. They would take out their sketch pads at every chance, perhaps stopping by a stream to discuss how to paint the water that gurgled and splashed over the rocks. Justin always seemed to have an idea. I think that since water moves fast, he would say, you should paint it fast and not be too careful, like this. And then he would quickly and artfully sketch the stream. It was perfect. His skill did not go unnoticed. Justin was quickly becoming known, not only among the students, but among the art experts. Many letters passed back and forth between him and his father. He noticed his father's handwriting was becoming more scribbly and hard to read. But his father always said, Son, I believe in you. I am here if you ever need me. Those words always brought a tear to Justin's eyes. It was this commitment that won Justin such fame among the gallery owners in Paris that he would work even harder because of his father's words. Throughout all of Europe, he became known. Art collectors began seeking out the paintings of Justin William Chase Jr. But fame and fortune took its toll. Where's my painting? demanded a wealthy collector who stormed into Justin's studio one day. But he had to stand in line. Others were waiting. When will you finish my order? I thought you would have my painting framed by now. Justin could only turn in his work and paint as fast and furiously as he could. He never realized there was so much pressure and disappointment connected with being famous. Sometimes in the middle of the painting, he would wonder, my father was famous, but he was always happy. Why am I so sad? Back in America, the old painter sensed that something was wrong. There were fewer letters than in the earlier days. And for another, art critics were beginning to question the works of the young artist, who, as they wrote, will never be as good as his father. The old artist sighed and sent a message. Son, come home. Come home before it's too late. Justin was shocked. Come home before it's too late, he read. What did this mean? Was his father's health worse? He put the letter down and looked around his studio. There were no longer lines of people asking for his work. Surrounding him were piles of unfinished paintings and blank canvases. He was afraid he would never be able to paint a beautiful painting again. He glanced again at his dad's message and tears filled his eyes. I've lost my talent and now I might lose my father. The following day, he booked passage on the next steamship back to America. Arriving at home, he hurried up the stairs, caught his breath, and quietly walked into the study. His father, frail and leaning on a cane, sat on his stool near one of the old easels. Sunlight streamed in and bathed the old man in a warm glow. I've been waiting for you, the painter said with a smile. 
Oh, Father, Justin cried as he walked over and knelt by the stool. I'm not too late. You're all right. Yes, everything's all right. And my son, it's not too late for you either. I've heard about your work, about your... Father, I'm so ashamed. After all these years, I finally realized I don't have your gift. I'll never be the artist you are. Buried his head against his father's knee. The old painter placed his hand on his son's head. Oh, dear Justin, I don't care if you are ever famous. I only care that you become all that God intends you to be. And for this, my child, it is not too late. Here, come with me to my easel. Justin walked over, arm in arm with his father, to one of the large blank canvases. They stood there for a moment, and then Justin held the brush in his hand, and the next thing he knew, his father was standing behind him and had wrapped his thin hand around his. Suddenly, he was a child again, feeling this, his arm lift and stretch as together his father and he painted the canvas. It was just two hands on a single brush, swirling and stroking and filling the entire canvas with beautiful color. Oh, this is wonderful, Justin laughed out loud. I haven't had this much fun in years. In less than an hour, his father and son stood before the most beautiful painting Justin had ever seen. Father, look at what you did. It's amazing. After all this time, you've only gotten better. Do you see this? He paused for a moment and was struck by the way the sun touched his father's face. The golden rays washed away the age and the wrinkles, and it looked as if he were seeing a side of his father he had never known. Father, look, do you see what you've done with while guiding my hand? No, Justin, I can't see. I am almost blind. I cannot see the canvas. <gasps> How? He stammered, turning to the painting. How did you how did you do this if you can't see? Justin, you did this. The gift never left you. All you needed was to overcome your fear and feel my touch and know my presence and love for you. To know God's love and presence. This is why I wanted you to come home. It wasn't for my sake. The old man wrapped his arms around his son. It was for your sake. Justin held his father as tightly as he could and cried, not with sad tears, but tears of relief and joy. Give of yourself wherever God places you, the old artist said as he patted his son's shoulder. And remember, for as long as he allows, my hand will always be near to guide you. Remember, God is our Father. And he gave us himself. He's omnipotent and he is our Prince of Peace. Have a good week.